Chaotic is the oldest spirit in the world. It's the mother spirit of all Anna spirits. I mean, even the word alcohol is an Arabic word. It comes from the word alcohol. It was the first digital spirit that was globally shipped and places as far as Mongolia today refer to the category of spirits in itself to be Arak. But Arak in itself is basically a triple distilled grape brandy. It's usually enjoyed with a meal where it's slipped slowly over the course of several hours with uh, different types of mezza dishes. And it's a, a tradition in the Middle East that's been consumed since the 19th century. Hello, hello. It's me, Whetstone co-founder and Point of Origin host, Stephen Satterfield. It's been a few months since our last podcast, and the world that we left behind is so, so much different with more sitting and reading and reflecting and contemplating, we can start to see plainly the ways in which our most vulnerable communities have always been the ones most closely bound to struggles for justice, land, and dignity. There is much to be garnered in understanding the past. We believe this so fiercely that we've dedicated our work to this premise entirely, centering concepts like origin, anthropology, and indigeneity. We considered our role in this moment of social uprising and the ways in which it is related to our work. At first, we thought of maybe doing an entire season through the filter of COVID-19 or the immense Black Lives Matter mobilization. But as we started to prepare for this season, what became clear is that the thing we do best is also the thing that is the most helpful in this moment. And that thing is absorbing and discussing food culture from the perspective of the global and the historical. We cannot comment intelligently on food, social uprisings, pandemics, or really anything in between with a perspective that is not international, intergenerational, and intersectional. So our plan for season three is the same as the first two, which is to explore the world of food worldwide. And in doing that, with the context that we provide and the people that we learn from, we hope helps us all understand the parts of our culture that are cyclical and collective and how we can learn from past struggles to meet this moment with unprecedented education and empathy. that, I'd like to welcome you all to Point of Origin Season 3. We begin with a trip to Palestine to discover the history behind the lesser-known spirit of Iraq. Whetstone contributing journalist Lyric Lewin brings us to the Muwadi Distillery. So, Lyric, you went to Palestine and met Nader and spent time on his land learning about Iraq, its history in Palestine, and how for Nader, Producing a rock is a revival of sorts in terms of the tradition and also the methodology. Yes, so Arak is a spirit that is traditional in the Levant. It's distilled from indigenous grapes that are used in winemaking and infused with anise seeds. It's a really smooth drink with a kick of licorice to it. Most people are familiar with Italian Sambuca or with Uzu from Greece, but not a lot of people know that those are all derived from the mother spirit, Arak. The history of Arak is really interesting because it evolved from the Arab invention of Alembic distillation around the 8th century. And basically, Alembics are these apparatuses used to distill or separate and purify substances. So they can be made from glass, ceramic, or copper, and they have two different parts. The bottom part will sit over a heat source, and that contains the substance that needs to be distilled. And then at the top is this bulb and tube sloping down and out, so that when the vapors rise and flow through the tube, they can cool down and condense away from the heat source. So truly, Europe and the rest of the world would not have their Sambuca or Uzu without this scientific invention from the Levant. And Muwadi Erak is made primarily with the Dubuki grape, which is one of many indigenous varietals in the West Bank. It's a white varietal that's large, round, sweet, and juicy. And Nader wants to make sure that he has as much juice per grape as possible because those will have a higher sugar content and that will yield the higher alcohol content. So in Palestine, we have 23 indigenous species of grapes. 
about maybe, you can say eight or nine of them are, are suitable for wine, uh, three of which are white parietals so that I use for my arak. I use primarily the buki, um, but there's also hamdani and jandali. Uh, the jandali, you can tell that the berries are smaller, uh, but they're much sweeter. The traditional way of growing vines in Palestine is in these beautiful goblet vines. The farmers grow the vines straight up like a little tree, basically. So there's no trellising. And that way, due to the harsh sun, the canopies of leaves can serve as protection for the grapes. Here's what Nader had to say. Growing up in the States for me, like um, I had a very bicultural upbringing, like on week, like at school we spoke English, but like when I came home, we spoke Arabic on the weekends, we spoke Arabic. And whenever we had like public holidays, whether it was Thanksgiving or the 4th of July, we always had like, you know, a small gathering of the Philadelphia Palestinian community. Mm -hmm. And um, in those gatherings, we always had Palestinian food and we always had Arak. Like Arak, it's, it's the drink that's synonymous with our cuisine. Like it goes best with our food. And... Um, we always had Lebanese Arak. I, I don't remember any Palestinian Arak ever being available there. And the, the brands we had, they were good. I mean, we had like Razouk, we had Masai, we had a couple of good brands out there. And I, I loved Arak. For me, like uh, at the time, like I mean, when I was younger, I used to drink whatever. But like over the years, like I sort of realized that I don't enjoy beer or wine as much as I enjoy Arak. Like when I was drinking, I would drink whatever. But now, like when you want to drink for pleasure, I enjoy Arak because it just goes best with the food that we eat here. Coming back here in like 2007, like uh, I remember I couldn't find good Arak. Like I used to enjoy Arak in the States, but like the Arak in the local market, it was just like, it, I, I don't want to shoot anyone down, but it, it wasn't on par. Sure. Like, I mean, it, it, it burnt, uh, the, mm -hmm. like going down, it was just, it didn't have the flavor. It didn't have the viscosity, the aroma. Um, it was just commercial, you can say. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what I used to do is, um, you know, Lebanese products coming into Palestine, because Israel and Lebanon are technically at war. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to get Lebanese goods into the West Bank because the West Bank is occupied by Israel. Um, so whenever I would go to Jordan, which is, you know, like a couple hours trip, yeah. uh, I would always, you know, pick up some Arak at the Duty Free and they usually had like popular Lebanese brands. And I'd bring them in, you know, with my suitcase or in a Duty Free bag or whatever. Um, and sometimes, you know, if I didn't have any on me and I had, like, you know, a gathering of friends who wanted to go out, have a barbecue, do whatever, um, you know, I'd stop by, like, a liquor store and you'd always find, like, the local Arak and then you'd find, like, one bottle of, like, some Lebanese brand, but it would be, like, $100 per bottle. And, you know, the, it got expensive and it wasn't yeah. sustainable. And uh, I figured, you know, if, if if I'm, like, killing myself to good quality Arak, I'm sure there's other Arak lovers, like, you know, on the market who want to get it. Right. Uh, so I, I, you know, I know I some friends of mine who only drink Arak exclusively, like myself, and um, you know they were doing the same thing more or less. So I figured, you know, that maybe then it would be a, a better feasible route for me just to explore the possibility of trying to make Arak. And from there, I just like bought a bunch of books. Like that was back in 2010 on Amazon about distilling and fermentation of grapes and making brandy. Really, I studied how to make cognac and brandy. Mm. Um, and from there, it's like an extra step how to make Arak. Um, I spent a lot, like a whole year, basically reading up on it, different websites, forums, uh, getting books off of Amazon. 2011, I purchased like a really little hobby still, it was like a small six liter still, and I was making tiny batches. Mm. Uh, and from like 2000, you can say, probably 2011, it was my first batch, all the way up until about uh, what was it, 2000. 2018, like uh, pretty much 2017, I was making like really tiny batches. Mm -hmm. I was making like, I started out with like 20 bottles and 30 and 40, made it up to about almost 100 bottles. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, I was basically trying to get people's feedback at first. And then I found that, you know, after, after I got a recipe down and people enjoyed it and I, you know, I incorporated all the feedback that I, you know, seemed to agree with. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to up production a little bit, see if I can sell it. You know, there wasn't interest. People were asking me for it. So I figured if people are asking me for it and giving it out for free, I might as well, you know, see if I can make something out on the side. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe one day I can make a business out of it, right? Like over the, because you know, over here there's a conflict, and, and you know, people here aren't very wealthy. There's you have like a very small upper class, and then you have a majority of people that probably don't have a lot of money, and there's a middle class barely exists here. Um, so I guess commercial producers over the year they began making like this inferior product that they call Arak. And uh, I guess they did it because, you know, if they want to sell, they have to sell something cheap. They need to sell something that people can afford to buy. And they cut a lot of corners and they began using like 96% industrial alcohol. And they would just buy it in like 1,000 liter containers. They'd knock it down with water to 53%. And then they'd add like anisole flavoring to it, like anise flavor. Uh, and then they would 
it was just like a it was a cocktail operation they just mix and bottle and that was it sure um and that's what made this inferior product on the market called Attic. But the problem with that is that um, people got driven away from Attic. You know, when people have a special occasion or a gathering or they want to get a gift for somebody, and you know, they want to get something you know that would you know reflect you know upon themselves as you know I got you a, a nice gift or whatever. Right. They're definitely not going to buy Attic. I mean, Attic was seen as like the poor man's drink and um, you know the drink of the masses. And a lot of people got it, went away from it. So I mean, like now people, you know, they they have this um, perception that Attic is inferior, and that if you want to drink something good, you got to drink whiskey or tequila. And they went towards the brown spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I, I, I like, and then people they forgot all about Attic. Like a lot of people here, like even in Palestine, I'm surprised. Like you know, it's the homeland of Attic. They they don't even know how Attic is made. They think it comes from anise, and they don't know that it's actually a grape brandy with anise flavoring. Gotcha. Um, and uh, to me, I mean, some people, like my small circle of friends who drink Arak, they were all enthusiastic about it. But the broader people, they just didn't get, like, what I was talking like, why are you making Arak? Why not make something else? And some people were like, if you're going to make spirits, go make whiskey. You know, people love whiskey. Um, but for me, I'm also I'm passionate about, like, you know, upholding our tradition and our heritage. And um, I, I, for me, I think it's like a travesty to drink whiskey with Palestinian food. I want to revive Arak. You know, yeah. I want to make Arak great again. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, I love that because you're almost you had like on top of everything else you were doing to make it you almost had like a rebranding mission to like rebrand Iraq to make it something that you could remind people no this is actually how amazing it can be. Yeah, I mean one of my goals I want to make people proud of Arak. I want to revive like Arak's like glory and like um, Mm. yeah I I I want Arak to be like you know something of national pride. Um, Mm. I feel like you know if we if it's these small things like where we. If we give up on these small, you know, parts of our heritage, you know, that all these little bits, like whether it's food or whether it's whatever, I mean, it makes up the fabric of our identity. And mm-hmm. if you give up on it, eventually you'll lose who you are. You lose your culture. You lose your, you know, your sense of self. We have a very rich culinary traditions here in Palestine. And in particular, like our um, our distilling heritage is very unique. I mean, uh, if if you saw my website, I mean, we Arabs in the Levant, we were, we were the first to create distilling. Uh, we were the first to uh, make spirits. We were the first to, you know, alcohol is an Arabic word. Alcohol comes from alcohol eyeliner, um, and that's what the still was created for. Because uh, it was a Muslim alchemist who created it, and he would have never created it for alcohol. Um, but you know, and when it reached the shores of the Mediterranean, you know, all these countries are saying, "What is it? Well, it's alcohol." And um, and now you have all these different spirits around the world, who who you know are offshoots of alcohol, whether that's pastis in France or sambuca in Italy, mm-hmm. or ouzo in, in, in Greece yeah. or yeah. rack turkey and spuro and so on. Um, so I mean, all these spirits come from this one mother spirit, which is Arak, the oldest spirit in the world. Wow. And I just think that you know the, the, the international community knows enough about the spirit, and I don't think that it gets the respect that it deserves. So definitely, I wanted to raise, you know, the, the aspect of, you know, our, our distilling heritage. I wanted that to be known. Yeah. Uh, and I just want, you know, like I said, I wanted people to know that I want to put Palestine on the map and let people know that Palestine produces high quality goods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, regarding the Palestinian narrative, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, that's kind of I mean, one and the same for me. Like, I mean, yeah. I try to, I, I try not to go into the politics of the conflict when I talk about my Arak. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, like that, that's sort of it. Like, I want just to put ourselves on the map and let people, you know, to share our culture with the international community and, um, you know, to, to share it with internationally and let the local people see, you know, what, what we can do with, you know, just the, the little means that we have here. No, I mean, for me, also, like, I'm hypersensitive like, about into the conflict. Like, um, not for the fact that, you know, like everyone has a political stance here. Like politics, it's part of our daily lives. You can sure. take our favorite pastime is sitting around and talking about politics. Um, but for me, like, um, I, I don't want to make it like, a, I don't want to like ride the conflict. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to, I, I don't want to talk about, like, I mean, sure, like, I, I buy my grapes from farmers and I buy my anise from farmers. My grapes in particular, they come from a problematic area. Um, it's an area where Israeli settlements are expanding. And I mean, I have farmers that I buy from who frequently have settlers trespassing on their property. They've been subject to attacks. Oftentimes the military prevents them from reaching their land. But for me, like, I don't want to make it, like, I, I don't want people to, I don't want to exploit the conflict. Like, I don't want to make it like part of my marketing. Like, I don't want people to buy my product because it's made in Palestine, because they like Palestine and want to support Palestine. For me, I want people to just drink my product because like, I, I want them just because they enjoy it. 
And uh, one of my goals is to make you know the world's most respected adak, and I want to do it as objectively as possible. I want people to you know I want the quality to to raise my product. I don't want to you know um, I would say like I mean I don't want people like I know that sometimes the conflict here can be sexy, and sometimes people might use that when it comes to marketing their goods locally like for an international audience. Right. Uh, that's not at all for me, and and I'm not even trying to target an international audience. For me, like I mean, I'm barely having, um, I'm barely able to meet local demand. Like I released my first batch in in November, and now I'm completely sold out. So Stephen Nader's been working to triple his output for this year. He went from using a hobby still in his basement to opening and renovating his own distillery with certifications and equipment. So in order to keep up with higher production, he has to secure more grapes from different Palestinian farmers. When I was there with him, it was late September of 2019, and he was checking out the grapes at one of the farm he uses to confirm that they were ready for harvest and delivery. And then he took us to the farm, which was in Area C. So that is under Israeli military occupation. So there are a lot of settlements around there, Israeli settlements who are illegally coming in and setting up um, homes and it's yeah it he Nader makes it clear he doesn't ever want to commodify the conflict for his product but I think it's worth noting because he has so many more obstacles to overcome to produce his arak than than someone else I mean even the farm we were at just over the fence there was an Israeli winery so they're shipping that out saying it's Israeli wine but it's grown and produced on Palestinian soil in the West Bank um, which was really upsetting. But then we got to see the farm where he harvests from. And then he had this um, table set up with all this meze and we were able to eat and drink together. And it was, it was inc- absolutely incredible. Oh. 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 Uh, I live in Area C. So Area C, it's uh, I live in a Palestinian village. Okay. But the area I live in, it's under Israeli military control, okay. and all of the areas west of where I live, which are the villages that I'm getting from, they're also under military control. There, are, there are like checkpoints in the area. Okay. Um, I, I live right next to a military base. But I mean, it, it depends on the situation on the ground. When things are tense. There'll be a lot more checkpoints. They'll set up flying checkpoints. They'll be stopping people a lot more often. Uh, it's they don't have so many problems delivering the grapes to me as much as they do have problems trying to care for the grapes. That's kind of how I frame it. Okay. I mean, for me, it's, it's not very far. It's like a five-minute drive. I can be like any. I can be like one of my first vineyards. Um, but for me, uh, it, it's more of a problem for them, really. I mean, to, to be honest, uh, they face a lot of problems because they live in like a very sensitive area where. Israeli settlements are trying to expand and take over as much territory as they can. Mm-hmm. So they're constantly having, you know, settlers invade their property, either uprooting vines, uh, tearing down vines, uh, bulldozing vines, burning vines. Uh, sometimes they're attacked for, for being in their land. Uh, they try not to stay out there late so they can only work during specific hours out of fear of being attacked. Um, a lot of like the settlements, they have like a peripheral security or buffer zone. And oftentimes, you know, it's difficult for them to get into their their vineyards in those areas uh, because if they do, they might be arrested by the military. Uh, So sometimes they do it on like, you know, when it's a Jewish holiday or if it's a Saturday, it's a holy day for the, you know, the settlers there aren't necessarily out. Mm -hmm. It's more safe. They feel more safe going out to their vineyards, that sort of thing. But yeah. Um, I I wanted, like, I'm obsessed with authenticity and, and doing things a traditional way. So in Palestine, we have 23 indigenous species of grapes. About maybe, you can say eight or nine of them are are suitable for wine. Uh, Three of which are white varietals, so that I use for my arak. I use primarily the buki, um, but there's also hamdani and jandali. Uh, The jandali, you can tell that the berries are smaller, uh, but they're much sweeter. Uh, The sugar content in them is crazy. You're talking like roughly like 210 grams of sugar per liter. but yeah, so I come and I check periodically, like every week I come and I take uh, samples of all the berries. I try and get like one from each corner of the vineyard, one in the center, different areas. And uh, we decide on a weekly basis which vines to pick. And uh, that's how we go about it generally. What I do is I just take the grapes, I crush them, and then I throw them in barrels. Wow. And then after that second distillation, that's the most complicated. <laughs> 
Um, then we get into the third distillation. For the third distillation, I take that purified spirit, I put it back in the still, um, I reduce it down to 30% every time because more than 30%, you're at risk of making an explosion. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I put it back in the still. Usually it's about like 70-something percent. Um, so I water it down to about 30. I put it back in the still, and uh, then I put aniseed in it. Okay. And what happens is the aniseed, as it, it soaks, I'll let it soak for a period of about 24 hours, it'll absorb the, the ethanol, and it'll release anethol, which is anise oil. Mm. And then the next day when I come back and I instill it, basically the anethol and the ethanol will ba both vaporize together simultaneously. And when I cool that vapor back into a liquid, now it's become one intertwined liquid, wow. um, which is the basis of Arak. And then from there, I'll take it, I'll load it into clay casks. I age it for a year. And roughly uh, after a year or so, um, I'll just start taking samples towards the end. I can dilute it down to a strength, which is 53%. And then from there, we have Radek. And then I hand bottle it, and I'm done. This is a, a spirit that we're talking about, right? This is not a, a liqueur, mm -hmm. right? Because of the alcohol content right. and the production method. Um, so I'm assuming you had a chance to, to taste. Yes. Um, what were, I mean, because you flew halfway around the world <laughs> without having uh, tasted this, presumably. So like, it, I mean, the story is interesting, but it's, hopefully it was a bonus um, if you got to taste it and it was enjoyable. Oh, absolutely. We had a truly amazing experience with him while we were there. So even to set the scene, when we first met up with him in Jerusalem, Nader wanted to take us to some of his friends' businesses too. So we got to try not only go and experience his um, his product, but also some of his friends who owned um, ice cream shops where they made Buza Erebia, which is this amazing ice cream that has this elasticity that I've never experienced before in my life. And we went to lots of different um, places and we had kanafe and it was incredible. So all that leading up the night before we went to the farm where he harvests his grapes, we went out to a bar that is the only bar that serves his Adak. So it was really cool to get to see it on the shelf. And then we actually tried a wine that night that was made from Dubuki grapes. So it was cool to get to experience the full process in that way, where it was like we were tasting the wine from Dubuki grapes. And then the next day we tasted the Adak, which was also made from the Dubuki grapes. So when we went to his distillery, he showed us first, he started the distillery in his basement. So we went to the basement of his house. And from there is when he made his first batch. And from that first batch, he submitted it to different festivals in London, in Berlin, in New York, and won awards. Like right away, he came out of the gate, like wanting people to know, like Palestine is a producer of high quality goods. The drink again, like I said, because it's infused with aniseeds it has a light licorice taste but it is really refreshing and with it pairs perfectly with the meze so with hummus and with like pickles and olives and baba ganoush and warm fresh pita it's so so divine yes i love that um over ice is that the best way Yes, you can serve it over ice, but one of the interesting things about Adak is that when it's bottled, it's a clear liquid, but when you serve it, you dilute it with water and it turns into this cloudy liquid, and that's known as the louche effect. So basically, it's the spontaneous emulsification of the essential oil of the aniseed when it hits the water. Oh, so beautiful. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with um, the the tradition of distilling um, in this parts of the world, especially when we think of, um, you know, the Islamic community. Um, we we don't immediately, in fact, the, we, we think about the opposite, which is an abstinence from alcohol. So True. it is a really important part of um, the reclamation and um, fits in so well with the kinds of stories that we see and cover all over the world, you know, where indigeneity um, is erased and the fight for it uh, to be protected or revived um, is really the cornerstone of so many producers that we cover. So um, thank you for bringing us yet another one. This is a really great story. It's great to learn about 
um, the indigenous grapes to learn about, um, you know, how liquor or spirits are produced. Um, of course, the geopolitical context and just the heart and spirit, you know, to actually revive um, Iraq is really amazing. So thank you for bringing us this story. And we're really excited to see it in print for volume six as well. Thank you, Stephen. It's been so wonderful to work with you and your team. So I'm excited to, to see it. And I'm excited for Nader's hard work to be out there for everyone to appreciate. Thank you so much to our guest, Lyric Lewin and Nader Muadi. You can read Lyric's full article on Nader and Iraq in the upcoming volume of Whetstone, Whetstone Volume 6, which will be released this summer. We'd also like to thank our incredible podcast producer, Celine Glager. Celine, you are the best. To our editor and Whetstone partner and director of video, David Alexander in London. Appreciate you, Dave. Thanks to our Whetstone production intern, Quentin LeBeau. And last but not least, my business partner, Mel Shi, who makes all things at Whetstone possible. Thank you, Mel. We'd also like to thank our partners in production at iHeartRadio, to Gabrielle Collins, our supervising producer, and executive producer, Christopher Hasiotis. We'll be back next week with more from the world of food worldwide. <laughs>